Hey there, welcome everyone. Uh, we are kicking off the Q&A session here with uh, Ayub, uh, who spoke about only takes a spark uh, popping a shell on 1,000 uh, nodes, uh, which was pretty awesome, pretty cool. Uh, good way of, of thinking about how to, how to scale up everything. Uh, and you know, not just hacking one system, but how can you use that to really spread out? Um, so really, uh, really, I heard this is also your first time speaking at DEF CON, is that correct? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we have. Uh, a I was actually going to give it. Yeah. Go ahead. No. Yeah. So I was just gonna say we have a tradition here at at DEF CON, um, which we call shoot the noob. And so really, it's just the tradition of you know, hey, taking a shot um, on stage for you know your first thing. It doesn't. It's not always liquor, right? So <laughs> people mistake that. But really, uh, just want to do that with you now. So I want to welcome you in the traditional DEF CON fashion. Uh, so uh, cheers. Oh boy. Okay. 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 Oh, you okay. got to pour it first. Wait okay. for it. <laughs> oh, sorry. I got to pour it first. Yeah. You, you had the prep. There you go. Okay. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Cheers. Thank Cheers. you. Awesome. So now that you've been officially indoctrinated to, to the DEF CON and DEF CON safe <laughs> mode, um, yeah, so uh, I, I, one of the first things, questions I'd ask, right? So, right, you recorded the talk a little bit ago. What have you been working on since? Anything new that you've kind of come up with or, you know, anything you found, anything, you know, that's changed since the talk was given? Uh, it has nothing to do with Spark. Actually, I was working on Spark like a few months ago now. Uh, but since then, I completely switched uh, subjects and topics. I've been working on AWS a little bit. I did actually a tool that reflectively loads uh, DLLs and executables uh, in memory, but I wrote it using Golang. So uh, I completely abandoned that area of research and they completely switched over to something completely different. So we'll see what comes up next. Good for you. That's a pretty good way to go is uh, you, you get some recognition for one thing and then you move off to something totally cool, totally new. It's excellent. Yeah. Well, we're excited to exactly. see where that... like this idea of discovering new stuff. Excellent. So is that a thing you find yourself doing often in your own research is that uh, you want to get a nice uh, breadth of experience and a lot of different things? Or how deep do you go before you uh, feel like you're comfortable with what you've learned? Um, I think I can, basically I use, my idea is go as deep as uh, you start to understand how it works, basically. Uh, before I was looking into mainframes, uh, and that took me like, I think two years of going through these 900 page documents published by IBM and these obscure systems and obscure um, forums actually talking about it. So um, I did the same thing with mainframes and then I let it go. Um, and I switched over to other areas and during that work, I think Spark came up and I was like, what the hell is this thing? And I dug into it and I found there was not, not much research was being done on it. And I thought, well, you know what would be fun? <laughs> Let's actually dig into it. And that's how it all started, really. It was just to, like uh, going after the next shiny thing, trying to understand how it works. And once you understand how it works, you try to bend its rules to do whatever you want with it. And hopefully write a tool about it, give a talk about it, and then move on to the next stuff. Yeah. How deep? Uh, just enough to understand it, really. Yeah. That's the goal. So what was it about Spark, really, other than the fact that it was new and there wasn't other research? I mean, there, what was it that really dragged you into this one? Because it's, it's an interesting system, as you uh, showed us in your talk. So what was the, the thing that uh, made you decide, okay, fine, this is where I'm going to spend the next year of my life? Dan, why not okay. you? <laughs> Uh, right, so I was working on the offensive side, and then I switched to the switched to the blue side, um, and I was helping a company secure their systems, etc. And they were all on these new um, shiny platforms, if you will. Everything was on AWS, multi-region, uh, CI/CD. I mean, they didn't click a single button; they pushed everything to code, and everything was deployed and scaled and stuff. Very, very sexy stuff. Uh, so I was, you know, trying to uh, help them secure that stuff and. Uh, after like six or seven months, uh, we thought we did a pretty good job locking pretty much everything that was supposed to be locked. There was no Windows, by the way, so that's why we came to this state. But anyway, <laughs> um, and then I was talking with this data scientist, just trying to understand what they do. Uh, uh, and he talk, talked about, some, mentioned something about Spark. And I was like, what is that? 
And he told me, oh, it's something that we use to make calculations and parse data. I mean, what do you mean parse data? Uh, how many machines do you have? And he's like, oh, actually it's like, I have 200 machines. It's like, what do you mean you have? It's like, oh, I spawned the cluster of 200 machines and that guy over there <laughs> spawned the cluster of 500 machines, et cetera, et cetera. So basically the company had like thousands of machines running sporadically, if you will, but uh, still, and I was like, okay, well, how do you walk me through it, please? And he showed me how he launched a job and how he did some calculations. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> Uh, and that's when where the all interest uh, spark came in, basically. That's awesome. Well, that's a great place to start. Yeah, you start seeing oh, a couple of commands, and all of a sudden there's this many machines doing something. I want to know that exactly. too. Yeah, he was writing Python code on a Jupyter notebook, uh, where you know there was no authentication, obviously, uh, and he was writing code and it executed over multiple machines, and I was like. Dude, this is amazing. Cool. And so I dig into it and yeah, that's what it all sounded. Well, yeah. All right. So it's a pretty specific setup that you are talking about in your, in your presentation. Um, how common is that is the setup that, that you're uh, speaking about uh, and how many other ways are there to configure this that might have more research opportunities? Well, the thing is, um, Basically, um, Spark cluster can be set up in very different ways. Um, the cluster manager, so, so the, the, basically the process, the component that is responsible for uh, linking applications to workers, that one can be replaceable. Uh, you can put whatever, not whatever you want, but you can put many different other components. In my talk, I only um, briefly demonstrated when it's the Spark, when it's Spark itself that is uh, doing the orchestration, but you can have other setups where it's actually Yarn, a product from Hadoop framework that is doing all this orchestration. Uh, and I think in 3.0, uh, you can even have Kubernetes doing the work. So you have all your pods coming up to do all the work. So it's much more, much sexier. And the, the one that I showed, uh, the one that bypasses authentication, um, that one only works on Spark standalone mode. So when it's actually Spark that's doing all the stuff. Uh, if you're if you're having Yarn in front, it's a completely different story. It's completely different, different protocol that's been going on. Um, that's some Hadoop shit. That's too much. Uh, that's a completely different beast. Um, it listens on a different port, etc. Like the tool that I released, Sparky handles it, but I didn't, you know go much deeper into it. So there's definitely some area of research there uh, to go to go into. And that's the default mode when you're using AWS managed service called EMR. So if you're using EMR and you spawn a cluster using uh, their service, it will by default use this yarn mode. So it will spin up yarn and then the work will be done by Spark cluster, uh, by Spark worker, sorry. Um, how much is its widespread and like ratio? From the studies that I saw, it was around 50, 50, maybe 40, 60, depending on which website you see. But um, yeah, basically the more traditional websites that had the companies that had Hadoop uh, before will stick to Yarn, whereas the new ones that will that have the luxury of starting a cluster of data miner from scratch will maybe opt more for the Spark standalone cluster. Okay, that makes sense. And 50, 50 means that there's there's stuff out there both more to study elsewhere and more to try and hit with the the research that you've done so interesting yeah i think so and it's a very i would say that look here's the thing uh, the infosec community is so much focused on windows i find uh that you know there's so many other great stuff to talk about and to research that you know in windows if you want to make a breakthrough you have to go through 20 years of past research try to find something new. Whereas in this big, shiny new technologies, well, it's right there. <laughs> it's like, you know, buffer overflows of 1999, it's right there. So there's much opportunity there to be taken. That's awesome. Yeah, and I'll ask a question too. So like, you know, you mentioned, you know, how much more efficient Spark is over Hadoop. Like, you know, are, would you say companies that are still heavily reliant on Hadoop are like behind the times? Like, should they be looking at Spark or is there better security there? Like what's, What's your take? Oh my God. <laughs> well, Hadoop has that thing. Well, it actually handles Kerberos authentication. Uh, 
Now, whether that's a good thing or not, that's up for debate. But uh, no, not really. Like my mantra really, I, I work in blue team. So this is, you know, blue team are talking basically production should be boring to paraphrase what other people were saying. Production should be boring. So if you have a Hadoop cluster of like 3000 machines that's doing the work and it's fun and everything is fine, then by all means continue. If you have a mainframe to do what you need to do. Uh, I've seen a post actually that emulates what Spark does, but only using shell commands. It works, uh, it's much cheaper. Uh, it runs on a single machine <laughs> and you don't have all the partitioning and the shuffling, you don't have all the network latencies, you don't have all that crappy stuff that makes it very, very, very slow comparison to comparison with every, keeping everything in memory and just working on a big sl slice of, a, of an object. So, I mean, hey, whatever works for the company uh, with that particular set of talent and that, that particular set of circumstances and data, I mean, go for it. That's my opinion, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, and you mentioned, so you have that blue team mindset. I mean, so I guess, how would you try to detect what you were doing during these attacks? Like, are there any particular tidbits you try to give to a company that's trying to secure their Spark instance, other than making sure it's patched? Very interesting question. Uh, very interesting. Here's the thing. Um, I never thought about that. That's how decorrelated the two worlds are for me. It's like I do blue, blue team in the morning and I do red team at night and that's how freaking they are apart. I never thought about, hi, hey, it would be good to release some Yara rules to detect this stuff. Never did it cross my mind. Um, Future research, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but it's, uh, to me, it's easier to patch, but I know that some, well, a lot of people will not be able to patch. Um, to me, the first thing you try is you try to patch. If you can patch, then you want to detect, then you want to mitigate it somehow. So you need to isolate it either through network firewall rules or uh, do something like that to, you know, basically isolate it from the rest of the reducer exposure, if you will. Now, if you can't do that either, well, well you got to detect it somehow. How would you detect it? Um, If you have some advanced correlation in place, I think you can detect it. Uh, I'm talking about specifically the exploit of replaying that single serialized object that triggers command execution. I'm talking specifically about that. One way to detect it is that unlike other Spark interactions, it's it like in that interaction specifically, you only send one command instead of the whole charade of, hey, Spark, hello, uh, which version are, are you running master? Yes. I'm gonna just run the application. Okay, here are the workers. You know, you have a, like 80 messages going around, but instead in that exploit, you only have one message. So if you can, if you have a tool that's advanced enough to make these kinds of cor correlations, say that, oh, this IP address only, or this session only did initiated that single communication, that single packet, then maybe it's suspicious because it didn't follow up with all the stuff. Um, that could give you a hint. You can also track the on out of memory errors that are spark like are um, on your machines. Um, that may be a bit noisy, but that could get you going. Um, but then again, a hacker could find another way to trigger the execution because I only gave out an example uh, using the on out of memory error. Another way, um, yeah, these are the two main things to look for the top of my head, basically. Sure. We got a follow-up question uh, from PC Square, it appears. Really well done talk. It looks like you did the magic on the Spark standalone, like we were mentioning there. Uh, did you get it working with Yarn 2? Uh, not a big deal. Let's see. Not a big deal, if not, but I imagine it's possible. Also, 100% uh, production should be boring. <laughs> Amazing. Um... Oh my God. Okay. So here's, here's the real story. So I found this thing on, on Spark and I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. I feel so great. You know what? I'm going to follow up. I'm going to see how it works on Yarn. Then I pulled up Yarn, did the installation, made it work on Sparky, right? So let's look up some wounds. So I turned up Wireshark and I saw the traffic that was on Wireshark and I was like, oh my God, I don't want to touch that. That's how foreign it was. That's how Yarn is more difficult than than Spark standalone. 
it's really, really more difficult. And I looked at it and I was like, fuck it. I don't want to look into it. That's really what went through my mind when I tried to do that on Yarn. Now, if you look for a similar vulnerability, I couldn't trigger it. Like I was playing around with Yarn a little bit, but I couldn't trigger the same vulnerability. Does that mean that it's not vulnerable in some way? Of course not. But um, by that time, I was like, ugh, Yarn is just too much for me. Uh, not gonna happen, not gonna waste my time on it. I'm gonna move on to other stuff. Maybe if you feel a connection with Yarn, you can dig into it. Please do so. Because uh, like I said, there's nothing out there on Yarn. I didn't find anything. So probably there are some stuff uh, to be sought after in Yarn. Well, and that, and that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so this, if somebody decides that they do want to pursue this, uh, pursue the yarn side and would like to ask you more questions, I'll, um, are you available for um, either consultations or for answering questions that people come up with uh, when, they, when they're when they doing this on their own? Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, yeah, definitely. Uh, like my Twitter is well, open. <laughs> right at the end of this, we'll have you post your any contact information you'd like for people to have access to in the Track One channel, and um, you can you can be a bit, uh, be there for people. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, when you look at this stuff, like when you look at the Spark source code, it's beautifully written, by the way. But it's it's written in Scala. Some of it is written in Scala, and it's it can be very daunting. Uh, the the syntax is weird and when you look information uh look, look out information on the web that talks about spark nothing like there are very like i think one blog post or like two maybe that are dedicated to the internals of spark everybody talks about how shuffling works and how it you know partitions data and stuff but nobody talks about how it works inside um so yeah there's a lot of things to figure out and some simple stuff when you explain them they, like they look simple but to get that information it, like, you know, it takes a little bit of time because nobody talks about that, those internals. Uh, so yeah, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate. Uh, just, you know, hit me on a DM or just uh, ping me or whatever. Cool. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, it's kind of, it's one of the things I thought was interesting too, right? So through this, through what you discovered, right? Like I was like, oh man, I wonder if he's going to report this to Apache. And then like, oh, oh, look, you did. I so I guess how did that interaction go, right? Like, how long did it take him to fix it, right? Like, was it a good interaction? Tips for other people to having to reach out to companies like that? Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> I t I sent them the phone. I think on twenty fourth of December or something like that. Okay, very bad of me. Um, then I got a response uh, from the Spark security team, uh, and they said, yeah, okay, we'll look into it, etc. But um, whatever, and I didn't receive a response later. And then my talk at Troopers got canceled. And I think one week before I decided to, you know, because I was rehearsing a little bit, so I said, you know what, let me just write them again to see where they are on this. And I got a response from the same guy saying, oh, you know what, we looked it over and we discarded it because it's not interesting. I was like, okay. <laughs> um, let me rephrase. Oh, and when I sent them, I sent them an email with the proof of concept. It's like a Python code that actually executes the code fully. So proof of concept, it's there. So it was really detailed email. And uh, yeah, so the guy said that they discarded it and I didn't understand. So I wrote a second email saying, are you sure you want to do that? Because you're right in the documentation that when authentication is enabled between this and this component, uh, that Etc. So you're kind of breaking this trust by allowing this vulnerability to go on, etc., etc., etc. And then I get a response saying, "Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Yeah, we made a mistake. We thought we were, you were talking about the RPC endpoint that we already got a report for. Uh, now, indeed, this is a, a dangerous vulnerability, etc. I'm going to put everything. And they, you know, um, so, I mean, it happens. If you, I do try it myself, and sometimes I get it wrong. So this is normal. Um, and then they went on to fix it. So all in all, it took. I think eight months, but since they acknowledged that it was a vulnerability, I, I think it only took like three months. Gotcha. So persistence was I key. <laughs> persistence was key. Well, I mean, my goal was not to get it out there to just publish it. And I didn't release the tool or I didn't even talk about it. I think I talked about it to two people who were very expert in Spark to validate that when I, I was not saying bullshit. Uh, and I asked them to not disclose it. Um, that's about it. Because my intent was not to just, you know, release that. I am pro full disclosure. 
but everybody should make their own choices and it depends on my mood. So uh, for that one, I decided, you know what, let's just keep it on the low key anyway. And, um, and yeah, and I think three weeks after this closing it, they released a complete uh, correction because it was not impacting only one function, it was imp impacting also two others. So they rewrote a class, et cetera. So we worked on the fix. Uh, well, I worked on the origin of the fix and then they took it over because more competent than me. And then um, the thing that was really long is the release process. Because they had the fix three weeks after I reported it, but since like, let's say beginning of April, they waited until July on the other version to the, for the six to actually release the fix. So that's the part that was long, not actually fixing it, just releasing it, but yeah. It's out there and we're all, we're all more secure for your efforts. So it's, you know, better than having no one looked in that area before. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and now we're talking about that. There was some interesting point during basically this whole Spark adventure. Uh, and I think I briefly touched upon it during the talk is that I was so like, I spent like a couple of hours, even days trying to understand how the RPC stuff worked and only to find out a couple of days later that somebody already published that vault. <laughs> so yeah, that was, that was very interesting. Uh, I don't know if it happened. I think it happens to some people, but basically you're just so stuck in like, you find yourself drawn into that code base and trying to understand how it works when all you have to do is actually Google the right keyword to get the actual exploit. Um, and it, you, when you do it, you feel a sense of frustration and, uh, um, but it's part of the game. So, yeah. And that's pretty good advice for uh, all of us who are into finding vulnerabilities and, and figuring out how to report them is that enumeration step goes on the software that you're working on and you have to read the state of the art of what people know. So uh, that's, that's a good thing to reinforce. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Well, so um, tell us a little bit more about the next thing that you're moving on to. You said, it sounds like you already have this idea of what you're researching next. Um, how, actually, I wrote down a small plan, of, not a plan, but a bullet, bullet points of what I want to do later. Um, I just released this tool called Reflect P, uh, which reflectively loads an assembly, uh, an assembly in a P object, and shout out to... Um, name right, please. Um, Rob. If needed, you can post it in the yep. uh, track one channel at the end. And... I will, I will post it. Okay. So his name is Rob Knopf. Well, he goes by the handle of Rob Knopf, sorry. Um, but I, yeah, I wrote a tool called ReflectP, which reflectively loads a P uh, executable in memory. And I borrowed his basically tool to reflectively load also P assemblies, so wrap up, great tool. Um, and why did I do that? So this is this is this is what I'm working on right now. And why did I do it? Is a very uh, I find interesting is that when you look at the same code uh, to do the same thing, but in PowerShell and other languages, is that uh, it's a huge script of like two thousand lines of code, no tests whatsoever, and you just launch it. And if it doesn't work, well, too bad. You can't debug a two thousand line PowerShell script. So I decided to write it from scratch using Golang and using like, you know, testing and good dev, well, what I call good dev practices, et cetera, so that anybody could just look at the code and understand what's going on and what are the steps and where it didn't work, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what I'm really working on. I'm trying to make this tool that will actually be easy to understand for people who just get into it and just want to understand how reflectively loading something works uh, on Windows. Uh, so that's the thing that, uh, taking most of my time right now. And my next big thing is Kubernetes. I really want to get into it. Um, there is all of the talks that I saw, uh, like 90% of them talk about how to abuse a Kubernetes setup with no authentication, no airbox, no nothing. I want to see like, what is there to exploit, um, you know, once you have all these security hardenings in place, is it possible to bypass? Uh, I don't know, namespace isolation is possible to bypass, thing control, et cetera, et cetera. So I want I want to really dig into it because uh, there's again, like I said, like I really look out for these niche 
topics uh, where there is not much talk, where there is not much tools available, and try to focus on them. And hopefully, something gets out out of this research. So that's yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So I, we're kind of wrapping up here at the end of the the time. Uh, is there anything else you want to share um, with with the group, or again, how to reach out to you? Like, again, we can post your contact information, but anywhere you want to point anyone to before we call it out uh, end here. Uh, no, nothing except that, uh, basically, uh, thank you for this. Thank you to the spark team. Uh, first of all, because honestly, amazing. Like when you look at the code base, you understand how talented these people are and, it's, uh, really a pleasure and a privilege to actually have interacted with some of you, especially some of you that I saw on stage talking about it. So I was pretty excited though. I tried to hide it a little bit. But yeah. So thank you all. Um, but again, like for people who want to basically go into InfoSec and um, break into it, give talks, do research, etc. My only advice is basically look out for all these small niche topics that are basically abandoned by everybody and go deep until you feel you understand it and then just go crazy with it. And then most surely something will pop out. Awesome. Awesome. That's great yeah. advice. I appreciate that. Yeah. And <laughs> I was going to say just one, one more thing, basically, um, was getting to, you know, since you did actually sit a lot, like a live demo, right? It was like, norm, you're, one thing you're missing out on not having the live DEF CON crowd is, you, you know, round of applause for having a demo work on stage. So since you actually did kind of roll that out, I just wanted to give you, you know, a nice, nice round of applause and get that in the Discord chat, too. Just, to, uh, just you know, thank you for, for getting that and getting it working and everything. Um, thank you very much. Cool. So I think that's it for us. So uh, again, thank you again for, for joining us and thanks for the talk and look forward to what, what's, uh, what you have coming up next and hopefully see you next year at DEF CON. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have fun. Bye-bye.